Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a quorum. Tonight is the March 11th meeting of the Sherburn Planning Board, and I'd like to call the meeting to order. We'll run through the agenda first. Our, uh, our chair, John Higley, is not here tonight, and a member, Chris Owen, is not here, but we do have a quorum with uh, myself, Addie Mae Weiss, and Will Dunham. For the agenda, uh, we normally do minutes first, it's seven, but we have no minutes to do, and uh, so we'll start with our 715 agenda, a master plan update. Uh, I think nothing has happened in the update of the master plan since our last meeting. So if everyone is in accord, we'll move on. Next will be uh, a fairly short discussing discussion of housing issues at 7.20. At 7.30, which is in 10 minutes, we'll take up the main item for tonight's meeting, uh, a public hearing of the zoning article, articles to be uh, presented at town meeting this year. There are four articles. We'll take the uh, two of the two small articles first on uh, non-conforming lots and non-conforming building, non -conforming buildings and a temporary moratorium on mar marijuana establishments. These are two really just corrections of the bylaws. Then we'll consider the open space subdivision bylaw and finally the affordable housing or inclusionary zoning bylaw. Next on the agenda, a hearing uh, regarding the update of the subdivision rules and regulations of the planning board. Then at nine o'clock, we'll discuss any new uh, issues in town center. And finally at 9.15, any other business that may come before the board. So we have 10 minutes before we begin the hearing. Are there any new developments in the arena of housing, for example, the uh, Coolidge Street developments, Hunting Lane or 41 North Main? Well, um, I'm not sure that it would be considered new, but for people who may not be, be aware, the uh, developers of that, of those two projects, uh, Pulte being the developers of Meadowbrook Commons, the age-restricted project with 67 units, of which seven are affordable, and then Baystone Development, who is the developer of the 40B apartment complex right next door, um, the, they will be, um, uh, at least as of now, they are scheduled to be on the agenda of the select board meeting of April 9th to present an update. I do know that they have been in contact with Framingham and Natick regarding utility connections, which are proposed to be private utilities. And there is a warrant article to uh, grant an easement in the roadways so that those private utilities can be um, accessed. And um, I think that's the major update on those projects. So uh, oh, one other thing. They have been going through the uh, Conservation Commission for their um, delineation of wetlands. That's underway as well. Uh, this is the the affordable housing rental development has been at CONCOM or Board of Health or the I think elderly it's both. affordable. Uh, it's it's the it's mostly at a minimum it's the apartment it's the 40B apartment development. But I think it, they're delineating the entire um, that would the two affect, parcels affect together. both parcels. Yes. Okay. Any new developments? At 41 North Main, since we last discussed. Um, no, I believe it's still in the hands of Mass Housing, and they're reviewing the comments that were submitted, as well as the rebuttal by the developer. And um, 
So it's just a matter of waiting for, for that to take place. And uh, at 31 Hunting Lane, is there any update from the last time we looked at uh, plans for those properties? No. Okay. No, still the same. So we'll leave that. Uh, are there any other housing issues, Addie Mae, that we should know about? Not, not really. <laughs> um, no, we're kind of... Is there something I'm thinking? I'm, I feel like I'm forgetting something, but... What were you, what's on your mind? You know? Oh, not related, not directly related, but I was just going to note that um, it's the U.S. Census is about to take place. Uh, it, the census will be if, as of April 1st, which is in just about two weeks, two and a half weeks. And that will, that affects us in the sense that uh, for the last 10 years we've been using as a base number of housing units 1,479 because that's what the 2010 census showed and our 40B requirement is 10% of that number. Uh, It'll take about a year to calculate all the numbers, but starting about a year from now, our number will increase by however many units that get counted as of April 1st. What's your estimate as to what the new uh, denominator will be? Uh, I haven't you know, done a, an exact count or estimate, but roughly off the top of my head, I would say 1550. Somewhere in that range. So adding about, adding about a hundred units. Yeah, well, eighty or so, seventy. Mm -hmm. The houses that are partially built, say at fifty nine North Main, uh, but not yet occupied, do they count? No. It has to be occupied houses. Com at least completed. They can be vacant, but not under they construction. They have to be completed. Yes. Yeah, we have two developments then that are only partially built and that are, you know, nothing is holding them up probably except sales at Correct. this point. Quitney Farms and uh, 59 North Main. And the fields. And the fields, yes, of course. So in a way, we're kind of lucky that they, <laughs> that they haven't been built to date. Our number will be lower because those, aren't, those projects aren't completed. Do you know what the estimated... Uh, occupation time is for the fields? Are they being sold at the moment? I think there's people think, living in them now. Yeah, they are? yeah they're being yeah. sold for sure. Oh, okay. Those units are, some of those units are occupied. But mm -hmm. I am surprised on 59 North Main, it was moving along so quickly and now it seems to be that there's a slowdown. Have you heard of any reason? I, no, I haven't heard of anything. It's pro probably just sales. As probably just sales. It looks like they have two affordable units in that group so far. Yeah, I that believe that's right. Yeah. So there, there's a certain formula they have to follow, right? Uh, in Well, in terms of building, they've built, uh, they have to build three affordable units, as I recall. They've built yes. two of them. So nothing should be Stopping them no, that shouldn't point. be holding them up now because they they've already built two of the three, so mm -hmm. they should be able to finish out finish it up as soon as they have the sales. Good. Well, while we're uh, waiting for 7:30 to start our hearings, um, oh, we can't jump down to town center because that is a timed issue. But no, we, but it's not a hearing. It's just a, it's just a. Oh, so we can talk about things. Under, let's yes. try to do that okay. in the couple of minutes we have. Um, maybe, uh, Gino, you can update us if there is any update on uh, Jameson Field testing or any yeah. other issues in town center that you know about. The only update on that is that uh, we, we don't have a final report because it, in, it in, involves... Uh, um, monitoring the, the water levels in the monitoring pipes that were installed when they did the soil testing back in November, I think it was. So um, spring season is obviously when the water levels are, the groundwater levels are highest. 
So they've, they've been taking a reading every month, mm -hmm. and um, I don't think they've done the March one yet, but we want to at least get into April and get April's reading as well before we get a final report. Do you think the levels are lower this year because of the lack of snow? And I would think so. You'd think so. But there are adjustment factors too that, that are generally used, but, mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't know. So we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. So there was surveying done for in preparation for engineering work for the sidewalk by from Abbey Road. Is that it's not any further than beyond that? Part. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up, though. That that should be ready to go out to bid again soon. Yeah. Along with uh, the uh, the Whitney Farm uh, trail to connect to the Upper Charles Trail and. Um, and the um, the signage for uh, Pine Hill School. That sidewalk's only though to s Cemetery Lane. Is that no, I thought it was a little further than it was a little further than that. Up to the the crossing, where the 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 lighted the, the lighted, the lighted cr crosswalk. Yeah, mm -hmm. crosswalk. Yeah, little by little, I noticed that our, our next meeting will be hearing from a representative of a citizens group that is working on a lighted, uh, a, a user activated lighted crosswalk uh, between the Pilgrim Church and that little shopping area and, uh, and town hall down below the church. So little by little we're trying to connect town center yes we have a long way to go all right it is in 10 seconds it will be 7 30 so i'd like to open the hearing for the four uh, zoning articles being sponsored by the planning board uh, for this year's town meeting uh do you know if you don't mind, could we start with the two smaller articles um, and maybe read the title of the article and um, explain essentially what it is? Sure. Uh, just before I do that, uh, we have a message from our chairman uh, suggesting that to mention that, they, which you already did, but I'm not sure if it was on TV, that we may recess in order to do oh, thank you. do the affordable housing trust uh, presentation next door, and then we would resume if that happens. Right. And also um, that if it may be advisable for people to stay at home, and they can text questions or comments if they're watching to. Uh, my email address, which is planning at sherbernma.org, and our chairman is uh, in the process of doing that. He will chime in, I'm sure, as we go along. All okay, right. so All now right. to the articles. Uh, uh, let me just say one thing. Uh, thank you, John, for watching over us, even from a remote <laughs> site. <laughs> Apparently, we do need it. Uh, yeah, we, we are going to, let me just explain the recess for a second a little better for, for the uh, hundreds of people watching at home. <laughs> uh, we, we do have to... Uh, someone come in here? Oh, uh, we can, yes. In fact, uh, let me say right now that we're going to recess uh, from our hearing, which we have opened, but we have to recess immediately because one of the zoning articles needs to be presented to advisory at this point. So with apologies to our... Wait. That we're going, are, are we going early? I guess. I Wait, told them to call us when, yeah, when they were ready they were for us. They on the agenda. They want her now. All right. It seems that we are recessing now to go to the advisory meeting where the uh, affordable housing bylaw and the housing trust bylaw uh, will be presented for vetting by, by advisory. So stay tuned. We'll be back. After these messages. After these messages. <laughs>
Okay, the planning board hearing is now resuming after our recess to uh, meet with advisory. Uh, it's now 8.35 and we're resuming with the uh, planning board articles for town meeting. We'll start with the two short articles. Uh, Gino, would you present these two articles? Yes. Uh, the one I'll start with first is the temporary moratorium on marijuana establishments. That was simply something that was put in place after the 2016 vote to legalize recreational marijuana to, to provide time for the town to uh, establish regulations. It expired in 2018, and in the meantime, the town has adopted permanent prohibitions on marijuana establishments, so it's just taking up space in the zoning bylaw, so it just simply gets, takes it off because it's not in effect. Uh, the second one it has to do with changes to non-conforming structures on conforming lots and conforming structures on non-conforming lots in cases where currently in either situation, if someone wants to put an addition on the house, even if, it, even if the addition meets all current zoning requirements, they have to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a finding, what's called a Section 6 finding, that the, uh, the addition does not increase the nonconformity and is no more detrimental to the neighborhood. Uh, so uh, this bylaw would uh, provide a little bit of relief from that so that if, as long as the uh, addition is conforming, that you could skip that step of going to the ZBA, you could just get a uh, zoning, uh, a building permit directly from the building inspector, and as long as the addition does not exceed 1,000 square feet. In cases where a non-conforming structure is on a non-conforming lot, or the addition does not conform, you would still need to go to ZBA. That, that's it. There was some question about the allowed, allowed size of the addition, and that was resolved with ZBA? By uh, putting in the, the limit of 1,000 square feet. Right. Great. So uh, this is a hearing on those bylaws. We've heard this before at Planning Board. This is mainly for the public to be informed on these two uh, uh, bylaw proposals. They will come up at town meeting. Um, we should probably repeat that anyone at home that has questions or comments or concerns about any of these bylaws can call in uh, or text. Is there a, a text or call number for that, Gino? <laughs> uh, email. I have my f email open on my phone, so anyone could email uh, at planning at sherburnma.org. Okay, great. Planning at sherburnma.org. Uh, do we want to accept call-ins? We could do that, I suppose. I think we need to. It's okay. a hearing, and it's an open okay. meeting. Uh, you, our lines are open. 508-533-8800. <laughs> <laughs> Call now. <laughs> <laughs> um, just kind of to note, the first two articles that we just talked about, those are considered really housekeeping, cleaning up language. They're not anything real yes. substantive. That right. Uh, there, it's just well, administrative, really. You know, uh, we, we. I did uh, propose that we next take the open space subdivision bylaw, but on second thought. This is also the night of the hearing for the subdivision rules and regulations uh, of the planning board uh, hearing. So it might make more sense to uh, do the subdivision bylaw and the rules and regulations hearing together. One sort of would fall into the other. Uh, Addie May, are you uh, able to present the affordable housing bylaw at this point? Can we can hook up your computer, I believe. Sure. <laughs> oh, wait, yes. I'm going to think about that one, which one we're doing. 
Sorry. Yeah, let's just see if you have the right. I've got. Wait a second. Uh, let's see if you have a port. Uh, no. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, amend that. Uh, anyway, you, you'll have to present it in the same way you just did at advisory. Or would you like to continue? Can I think I, we can't continue it because yeah, we have to continue. present it. Can I try emailing it to your computer? You can try. Mm -hmm. should, I should have done it to begin with. Uh, what did I do? No, I did the wrong thing. I oh, OK. Actually, we're going to project it on the screen. Okay. If we're successful in getting the file from uh, Addie's computer to mine, that remains to be seen. Can you email it to my Gmail account? I thought I just did, just check and see, did you get anything? Uh, I'm, I'm still booting up. I thought it was organized and prepared. Apologies. Well, I'm turning it to me, I can get it on the screen. Uh, you can get the computer on the screen? Or can we just, can I just uh, project it and can yep, you uh, yep, get the screen in yep, your, yep. in your view? Yep. Okay, let's see if it comes through any man. Okay, I got it. Okay, it looks like I've got the PowerPoint version. Is that okay? Can you focus? A little fuzzy. Oops. I think that's about as good as it's going okay. to get. Okay. Okay, so the affordable housing bylaw, which essentially is also known as inclusionary zoning, it requires new real estate development to include affordable housing. This is for all new real estate development, not including single family houses. So, so if you wanna to go to the next slide, Marion, since you've got, um, why do we need an affordable housing bylaw? It's, uh, the state does not have enough affordable housing. That's where the pressure state created Mass General Law Chapter 40B, which we are familiar with, enabling housing developers to circumvent local zoning for communities that don't have 10% affordable housing. 
The bylaw requires all new development of two or more housing units to build or help fund affordable housing, and it will help us reach and stay above our 10% affordable housing goals. So these are, again, to control what type of development we have in Sherborne once we finally do reach 10%. Um, so this is really targeted for subdivisions. Um, or again, it's anything with more than one unit. So not a single family house, not a lot that gets torn down and a, and a house built. It would um, also be for any multi-unit development, yeah, right? Like right, any elderly affordable or yeah, um, apartments. So it has a, a formula that allows for if it's less than six units, so one through well, that we two through five. It should have changed. Um, that we change that to two to five. Yeah. So that slide. Did I not? Pull up the oh, shoot, did I not pull up the right slide? This is where we worked on this so many times we have too many different versions. Um, but it should be two through five payment in lieu. There's no payment in lieu required on a single family house construction. Um, units six for six and more units is fifteen percent for affordable. Um, there's a, f a calculation for if it's half unit, then we ask for it to be rounded up when we're calculating for how many units will need to be constructed affordable. And um, there's always the option to do, if it's two units affordable, to do one affordable unit construct and the rest in a payment in lieu. I guess we can go to the next slide. Um, and there are standards that are out there. So the same standards that Chapter 40B applies for um, Mass Department of Housing and Community Development, DHCD, for the building standards. These will apply also for the state in order to make sure that any affordable units count on our SHI. Uh, On-site affordable units are permitted by right. Anything, and we also, though, allow off-site affordable units. So if you have a development and you need to, a developer needs to add one affordable unit, they can do that affordable unit um, elsewhere with the right approvals. So there are options to be creative. Um, Abby, maybe I ask a yeah. question? Um, if on-site affordable units are by right, does that imply that affordable units off-site require a special permit? It's, yes, that it would have to be approved, right? If off-site, it's not a special permit. Special permit, yes. Yeah, a special permit, okay, right. yeah. So if it, it's by right for it to be on-site, and if a developer wants to do something different, they would come before the planning board and, and explain, and we would have mm -hmm. the ability to grant or not grant a special permit for that. Um, and the payment in lieu would be made to the Affordable Housing Trust in order that's where we've established for funds to be collected for the uh, uh, preservation and um, creation of affordable housing in Sherborne. And this looks like um, the The equation that you have in the uh, bylaw, here you say two-year median sale price of market rate. Is that one year? It's supposed to be one year or two years? Two years. 24 two months. Years. Oh, 24 yep. months. That's 24 right. That's months. Two years. So two years okay. median so in order to calculate what the median sale price is. Mm -hmm. um, so you'd have N being, so the, the number of affordable units would be the um, multiplied by the market rate minus the amount of, a, of a, a affordable house sale in order to get the required payment. So, um, and the affordable price is calculated by DHCD. Mm -hmm. So it's a, there's a standard and there's formulas. Um, so projects with six or more units 
just as an example, um, I think the same thing as the slide before that if it's fewer than six, then there's a payment in lieu that's calculated. But if it's six or more, then it's the number of units times the median sales price for the market rate calculated at a based on 24 year 24 month average minus the affordable price set by DHCD. For the next slide, you have some examples. I think there's a repeat of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's the wrong slide set. Wrong slide set. Dang. John, John yeah, he's probably. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I did that. Okay, apologies to our audience at home. Um, we have to put up a different slide set. This was This a, was an alternative. This was an alternative. Had some ah. alternative calculations for the for the payment and such that John had worked out, but um, it doesn't match what's in the bylaw. It's a slight, not a totally different, but it's just slightly different. Okay, back to email. Uh, let's see if I got another email. It should be in Dropbox. Yeah, it's in, it's in Dropbox. It's in Dropbox. Also. But he said, he said he was emailing it. Okay, it's easier, faster for me to get if he emails, but I don't have an email yet from him. Um, um, if you go into Dropbox. I'll go into Dropbox. Okay. Hmm. Okay, let's look for Dropbox. I think it's in here. A box. It's um. Okay, I'm trying to remember where my Dropbox link is. Sorry, people. This is. Here we go. This is the last time John gets sick. He sent it, why don't you just open, I oh know, yeah, just open up the um, email that he sent. I don't have his email yet. It I, just came in. Oh, okay, that's faster then. Okay, back to email. Here we go. So the, basically, the whole inclusionary zoning is a tool to help us try and stay at or maintain the 10 percent once we get to 10 percent. And it's also a tool for um, it gives developers an option. They either can construct the affordable units or they can do a payment in lieu, in which the case the money goes to the housing trust, in which would then allow um, the trustees to find ways to add affordable units if right. we're needed. We could be at a point, if we're at 10%, that we, um, there's creative uses of you know, maintaining or improving. So here's the formula for projects with fewer than six units. Basically, it's one-sixth of the cost of what it would be for uh, uh, per affordable housing, uh, for a whole affordable housing unit um, times the number of housing units if it's less than six. So the bylaw has language that directs the affordable purchase and rental prices to make sure that it's in compliance with, with DHCD since everything, the goal is to make sure any affordable units are, will count on SHI list towards the 10% required um, applicant responsibilities are the same as for all affordable units. There's just um, marketing and regulatory 
indeed restrictions that require are required for a unit to be SHI eligible. And the same calculation for if you're developing a subdivision and you are with a mix of affordable units, this, there's calculation that DHCD has created would apply. It's the same. Um, and the same uh, in perpetu perpetuity for um, the affordability would also apply. Mm -hmm. So why now? There's, there's a demand for affordable housing. We are at roughly, we could generously round up, say, 4%, so we're not near 10%. And this allows, this provides an, an, abil an option that would help us that's separate from 40 B's in order to ensure that we continue to add affordable units if there's a subdivision since a subdivision would considerably increase our denominator as far as the number of houses in um, total housing inventory when you're trying to maintain 10 percent affordable units. Um, it provide guidance for, again, what type of development we'd like to see in Sherborne and has clearly stated rules with the calculations on what sets the expectation of what we're expecting for how many units affordable and what options they have. And it also provides an option for funding for the housing trust if the developer chooses not to build the affordable units and th that can, can be applied in another way. Um, and it is a zoning bylaw, so it does require a two-thirds vote. I mean, as, as we are approving uh, affordable housing or not approving 40B, they're coming anyway, but the ones that we are approving, especially on Coolidge Street, for example, uh, working with that developer, we may reach or almost reach our 10% goal. So going forward, this is really crucial because soon we have a new census count coming up and uh, that may put us below 10% even with all of our new housing and this will help us keep above the 10%. So um, this is so much better than 40B developments because the town has a lot to say about it. Unlike 40B, this continues to go to before the planning board and the other town boards. Mm -hmm. Is that the last slide? I believe. Yes, it is the last slide. Are there any other comments from the board at this point? Okay. We got some good like language changes from uh, advisory, so that'll be updated and it'll be represented this coming Saturday. Um, at the advisory select board joint joint meeting for town meeting articles. Thanks, Addie. Right. The majority of the comments from advisory were things that um, just adding glossary and explaining where places where we've referred to DHCD language and uh, maybe mm. spelling a few of those things out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Are there any comments from home? The lines no. are open. We yeah, all <laughs> now, Seriously, everyone is welcome to uh, chime in. So, shall we move on to the open space subdivision? That's a little bylaw. more exciting. <laughs> I think so. But, okay. So, we need your. Yeah, I can just uh, pull up my slides. Uh, you you might just keep it on the screen, Rick, because I'm going yeah, to use. I don't know if it was still going. Okay, here's my PDF. Here's my okay. Here's my bylaw. So now we're moving to uh, the fourth planning board article for town meeting. This one is uh, concerned with uh, subdivisions. A lot of people don't realize there are already 25 subdivisions in Sherburne, and yet there's still quite a lot of open space uh, that's not under conservation and not legally protected. Focus that there. That's a little better. 
Um, in fact, the, uh, the Land Acquisition Committee that I also sit on has identified over 20 properties that are 20 acres or more. And uh, given the housing pressure now in Boston, uh, we could expect to see new subdivision developments come into, into Sherburne, although uh, for the last decades there have been very few. So this uh, bylaw is in anticipation of the possibility that a developer could come to Sherburne looking to build a subdivision. And by state law, a developer has a right to subdivide land and build a subdivision if, if he or she owns the land. So how can we control housing development while still maintaining our open space? That's the fundamental problem that we tried to address in the master plan. And this subdivision proposal is a step in that direction. What we'd like to do is uh, allow housing as we need to, but still preserve as much open space as we possibly can. Now, as I said, Massachusetts law uh, does not allow towns to reject subdivision developments outright. S the, a developer has a right to build some kind of subdivision by right, but state law doesn't prescribe what kind of subdivision. Up till now, it's been generally assumed that uh, that by right subdivision is a conventional one where uh, the lots are all of the size, of the regular size of the zoning district and consume the entire parcel, which leaves us no open space. But it seems that uh, towns can uh, pass subdivision bylaws that uh, restrict uh, the, or that control the plans of subdivisions such that uh, housing is restricted to a smaller part of the subdivision and the rest is preserved as open space. So this bylaw revision uh, proposes that open space subdivisions that have conservation land included be the buy right option. A developer can do this by right, of course, with a lot of other controls that I'll talk about in a minute. A conventional subdivision would be a deviation from our bylaws and regulations and would require a special permit. So this new open space subdivision bylaw is a revision of a bylaw that we've had since 1996 uh, for open space subdivisions that required a special permit and that preserved uh, only 40% of the land as open space. Uh, this revised bylaw it preserves 60% of the land as open space. And the houses, roads, etc., are constricted to 40% of the property. Of course, this means that housing will be uh, uh, clustered or at least denser than in the rest of the zoning district. The lots could be as big as one acre or, or as, small or as small as the land will permit. Um, it's important to note that the overall subdivision layout can be determined by the planning board in collaboration with the developer and with this, the Board of Public Health and the Conservation Commission such that the building area is restricted to areas of the land that can, that can support housing. And the open space areas can be placed by the planning board to, uh, in areas that are se environmentally sensitive and, and should be preserved. So lot size and arrangement is flexible. Uh, the frontage can be reduced on subdivision roads and the setbacks can be smaller depending on the ability of the houses to have septic systems and wells. Uh, they can be clustered in pocket neighborhoods or other arrangements. Groundwater and wetland protection is always the main concern of Sherburn residents. So uh, placement of developed areas has to be approved by the planning board. The developer can't just put houses where he wants. And of course, we would decide that in collaboration with Board of Health and CONCOM. 
since houses may be clustered closer together, it's important that a butters be protected and that the views from our scenic roads be protected. So we have increased setbacks, both for a butters and, and from existing roads. So those are the essentials. To show how this might work, we've taken one uh, subdivision neighborhood that is, exists in Sherbert. This was built, I think, in the late 60s or 70s. Uh, the subdivision is the one down by Parks Drive, Jackson Road, and, and Ward Lane. Uh, this is a subdivision with no direct access to, to protected open space. It abuts a lot of wetlands. It also abuts Holliston. That's that green area below. It's not open space. That's Holliston. And you can see that as it is, it's a very nice subdivision, but the houses and lawns and roads consume the entire parcel. If this had been designed as an open space subdivision using our proposed bylaw, it could look something like this. The conventional subdivision that exists is on the left, an open space design, one of many possible open space designs, is on the right, where um, the same number of houses that were built in the conventional subdivision are now in uh, a smaller area on the upland part of the subdivision. And you'll note that there's a lot more buffer area between the houses and the wetlands, and that the open space has room for trails, bike roads. You could even have a community garden. You could have play areas for kids. It would be a common park. And it could either be owned by the subdivision as a homeowners association common ownership, or it could be transferred to the town or to a, a conservation nonprofit organization, in which case it might be opened uh, for all of Sherburn to enjoy. <coughs> the owner of the property, that is the subdivision or developer, uh, would have the choice as to how that open space is managed, but the important thing is it would be permanently preserved. Now, <coughs> it's important to note that uh, even though the design, the open space subdivision on the right would be by right uh, developers can't do anything they want. There are a lot of controls on subdivision development of any kind. Uh, in fact, the planning board uh, subdivision rules and regulations is 44 pages long, and we're not going to go through it. You'll be happy to notice right now. But uh, to summarize, the bylaw only covers the, the main uses of the land, the types of houses, dimensions, frontage, setbacks, and certain special permits. Most of what's decided in a subdivision is actually in the rules and regulations, and we're going to have a hearing on that uh, uh, coming up. The rules and regs determine overall site design and building design, infrastructure standards, roads, sidewalks, all kinds of inf infrastructure, uh, the requirements for environmental data and analysis, and most importantly, they determine the processes for how the subdivision gets approved. And on that note, in this case, the first thing that the planning board would do is to have a preliminary discussion with the developer. And we've outlined in our rules and regulations uh, in detail what that preliminary discussion would include. We'd start with the lot, nothing on it, and look at the environmental features and determine which features need, which parts need to be protected. And then in collaboration with the developer, we would decide where housing can safely be built such that it doesn't affect our groundwater. The pl both the preliminary and definitive plans have a lot of environmental uh, assessment required. The assessment in the definitive plan is quite detailed. And finally, the whole review process would be done in collaboration with the Board of Health and CONCOM uh, because uh, protection of our well water and wetlands and groundwater is our primary concern. 
So why would a developer want to do this and why would anyone want to buy such a house? For the developer, the infrastructure costs are lower and there's less payment. Pavement. Uh, they don't have to go through a special permit process and it can be marketed as an eco-friendly development with, uh, with guaranteed access to open space. I should mention that in one town in Westford in which a developer has to present two alternative plans to the planning board and the developer has a right to do either. Um, most developments have, most developers have chosen to do an open space design probably because they see the advantages to their own marketing ability. For the buyer, a lot of people these days don't want to be off in the woods by themselves. They want to have social connections and a kid-friendly environment where the kids can get to each other's houses on bikes or walking. Certainly the maintenance is easier because you don't have as much land to manage and you have guaranteed access to a big area of open space. How about the town? Well, all in all, there are concerns from the Board of Health and CONCOM about placing septic systems in these uh, subdivisions such that the wetlands and wells are not impacted. And uh, our rules and regulations are dealing with that. We're continuing to work with both boards on that. Uh, but in sum, if you have a large area that is not disturbed, it's going to be uh, recharging and uh, retaining uh, rainwater and groundwater much better than a subdivision, than a conventional subdivision. Of course, climate control is a big concern these days, and the more open space and trees, the better we control our climate, both locally and and globally. And we, we think these can be designed such that they preserve the open space and rural atmosphere. Certainly it preserves a lot of open space over the town. The maintenance cost for the, de for the town will be lower. And uh, the tax revenue could be equal or even could be greater because we've seen that houses with two acre zoning are, have about the same tax valuation in this town as houses with one acre zoning. And if zoning is somewhat, if the uh, lots are somewhat less than one acre, still the fact that they are in an attractive neighborhood with tremendous access to open space will increase the tax uh, revenue on, will increase the tax valuation, I should say on the houses in an open space subdivision. So we don't think it will have a negative impact on tax revenue to the town. So that's a summary of the bylaw. Are there any questions? I should say that this has been vetted by three lawyers, including town council. Our, uh, our resident uh, uh, lawyer, Jim Murphy, who has been really helpful over the course of a year and uh, one of the members of our advisory board, who, of our advisory board, who's a lawyer, has uh, made a lot of uh, improvements. So, this is the result, and we hope you'll vote for this at town meeting. Thank you. Do we have any comments from the planning board? Um, just that, if you go back, it, it is kind of exciting when you look at that how that could look the development, the side by side, and seeing the trails, and seeing, I mean, especially since it is my neighborhood, and seeing where you could have had some, you know, gardens, and and there is a trend towards people wanting to live a little bit closer and having a little bit less yard to maintain. You still, when you're looking at those lot sizes, and I think when they said they were, most of them are approximately one acre and possibly a little bit less, which is what we have in some areas throughout town already in subdivisions. If you look at Ivy Lane, those are one acre zoning. So uh, we're not talking about, you know, towns where houses are on quarter acre lot sizes. This is um, 
or smaller. These are they're still fairly generous lot sizes, but mm -hmm. the the land is used much more creatively. Thanks. And, and any kids in this subdivision would be able to ride their bike safely around the entire subdivision on bike lanes or sidewalks. There are a lot of other changes in the rules and regulations that make it more uh, environmentally and kid friendly as well. And we might mention some of those later. But one could um, have community gardens. And um, I should mention another way that we're going to determine where the open space would be is we'll also take into account adjacent open space in the town and trails to try to increase the trail connections. Any other questions? Anything coming from home? All right, thank you. Uh, I'll close the hearing on this article. And I guess I didn't formally close the hearing on the, on the affordable housing article. Gina, do we have to vote on closing the hearing? Yes. You can close them. It's, I can it's close really, them all it's, together? It's like one, yeah, it's one hearing with multiple articles. So you can do it one vote and close them all. OK. If there are any, no more comments, uh, I'll close the hearing on all four of these articles. Do I have a motion? Second. Okay, I moved. Okay. Any <laughs> discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Tonight we also have a hearing on the uh, rules and regulations. Um, you don't have any slides for rules and regulations, do you? I don't. Okay, so no, no more for the. So we'll just go back to the table. I'll close this up and we can shut it down later. So the rules and regulations don't go to town meeting. Correct? No, they do not. They're just a. And uh, you do have a, a table that I think is in your packet. Is this in the packet, Gina? Um, uh, it may not no, be. I have copies. Uh, actually, it's on the, uh, I have a list of rules and regulation changes. We're continuing to work with Board of Health and CONCOM on this. We've come a long way. I think we've worked out a lot of the potential problems, but uh, we still have a few things to work out. On, on, on one side of the uh, page, this side you're looking at is a summary of the bylaw that we just did. If you turn it over, the reverse side has a quick summary of the rules and regulations changes. Um, um, uh, just tur turn the page over, yeah. So there, there are many, many changes, and it's a long document. Uh, it is in our Dropbox, and uh, can we make it available publicly, Gino? Yes, we could put it on the uh, website. On the website. website, okay. We could put it on the website with the track changes in red um, so that people can see what has been changed. Uh, first of all, in the existing rules and regs, developers were simply invited to talk to planning board or to the town planner, to Gino, if they're going to submit a preliminary uh, subdivision plan or even a definitive subdivision plan. And uh, I think Gina will confirm they, they usually do come in and chat, but there's no formal process. We're putting a more formal process in place. We can't force developers to do this, but if they want something approved, uh, I think it's pretty clear now from the rules and regs that they'd better come in and request a preliminary meeting at which we would look at the site and review the environmental features and we would with or ask this, the developer to produce a couple of sketch plans to show us where he would place development and place the open space. And we would decide where we would place the development and the open space. 
and we could negotiate. We would try to agree on the best layout, but in the end, planning board has the right to refuse a subdivision that doesn't conserve the land that we, with the advice of CONCOM and Board of Health, think really needs to be preserved. So the placement, we can't, uh, we can't dictate where septic systems are going to be or what their capacity must be because that is Board of Health rules and Board of Health rules will apply. But we can determine where housing will be placed on the property. And of course we would place it in areas that where the soils are appropriate and uh, where they are least likely to affect environmental features. Another change in the rules and regs is that uh, the original specified that all subdivisions had, had to have road right-of-ways 60 feet wide. And we know how wide that is. Our subdivisions have very wide rolls, uh, roads. And they have sidewalks that are seldom used because people walk in the road. <laughs> So we have reduced the, right of, the road right of way to 45 feet. That saves a lot of open space right there. The pavement width was 24 feet. We've reduced it to 20 feet in a subdivision. And depending on the design, sidewalks are not necessarily required. But where we want kids and people to be able to walk safely, we. Uh, they can put sidewalks or bike paths or walking paths. It's much more flexible and the design can be specific to the subdivision. The present uh, rules and regs require that the roadside landscaping, that is the right-of-way that's not paved, uh, has to be uh, lawn grass. But that's not very good for uh, recharging water. Rainwater coming off the road will just run right over lawn grass and, and uh, it, the recharge will be poor. So low impact development principles require that runoff sites like road sites should have swales, native plants, plantings that retain water and maximize water table recharge or groundwater recharge. As far as wells and septic systems, the planning board can approve the overall subdivision design and the placement of the developed areas. The actual septic design, of course, has to be approved by the planning board, by the Board of Health, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oops, Board of Health. Uh, and wetland protection, the same. The planning board can place housing with CONCOM's uh, advice where it is safest for wetlands and groundwater. Uh, but the CONCOM uh, ultimately will enforce their wetland setback rules. So we also uh, require a groundwater impact analysis. Whereas before it was uh, may be required, now we absolutely require it. So I think the rules and regs that we've changed apply not only to open space subdivisions, but if a special permit is ever allowed for a conventional subdivision, these same environmental principles would still apply. So. That is an improvement overall. And the rules and regs will be posted on the town website. Are there any questions from the planning board? All right, if not, shall we move to uh, approve the rules and regulations changes and uh, close the hearing? So moved. Second. Are there, is there any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. 
Okay, the rules and regulations changes are adopted as they are, understanding that they may be amended still by the Board of Health and CONCOM or with the Board of Health and CONCOM's advice. All right, the meeting, uh, the hearing is closed. Thank you. So back to the agenda. I think that wraps up our agenda for tonight, unless there are issues um, not foreseen 48 hours in advance. Are we good? I don't, I'm not aware of any other issues that need to be discussed tonight. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Nice job, Mary. Yes, no discussion. <laughs> All in favor? The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. <laughs>